welcome to Global Perspectives. What's the best way to help victims and survivors of human trafficking? For answers, we turn to Ambassador Luis Sedebaca. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Lou. It's great to be here, thank you. Tell us, uh, you didn't get up one day and decide to go into the business of combating human trafficking. What, what were you thinking about when you were very young as far as a potential career? Well, I started out uh, looking at the international agriculture development as what I was interested in. My parents had uh, worked in Latin America during the Alliance for Progress uh, under President Kennedy. Uh, my father in agricultural uh, development, my mom did some of the first uh, work on rural women's lives in Latin America. And so that was always, I think, in our family's interest and, and in the blood. Um, and so when I went to law school, um, I realized that I could do that just as much uh, here at home in the United States, uh, working uh, with farm workers' rights uh, and uh, other groups uh, that were fighting for the rights of vulnerable. Uh, so I ended up going to the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice and ended up having a career that was very similar than I would have if I had gone into international development work. Your family has long roots in this country. That something I'm sure would be of interest to our viewers. Could you tell us a little bit about that before we get into the very fast-paced life that followed after the Department of Justice? Well, the first member of my family that was here in Central Florida um, was Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, who came in 1527, um, he and the, it was the second expedition, and I think they were looking for the gold uh, and uh, the fountain of youth that uh, were rumored here. Uh, they got shipwrecked over by Tampa uh, by a hurricane. They built boats and ended up in Texas. He uh, explored, which is a charitable word for wandered uh, for eight years in the wilderness. Uh, in that area. Um, so, uh, as we always laugh in our family, he was the one conquistador uh, in history that didn't conquer anything. Uh, but what he did do is he was able to leave a, a remarkable ethnographic study of the kind of Indians and, and Americans at the time of uh, the entrance of European expansion. And so that's something that for us, I think, you know, as a family, uh, we've always looked at, that we have to be uh, good entrance upon the world and that we have to be uh, thinking about those vulnerable communities. So that background accompanied you as you moved into the Department of Justice and, and you spent a good number of years fighting against different types of criminal activity. I did. You know, the, ju the Justice Department basically in the Civil Rights Division criminal section focuses on three main areas, police brutality, hate crimes, and slavery. And at different times over the last hundred years, it's focused more on one over the other. But in the 1990s, when I first joined it, all three of those were hitting simultaneously. We had the militia movement uh, with the different white su supremacists. Um, we had police brutality coming out of the uh, wake of the beating of Rodney King by the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, and we had a resurgence in involuntary servitude and slavery as new groups of people were being brought in to replace African Americans who'd successfully fought for their rights and made it out of the fields here in Florida and otherwise. And so it was kind of a, a, a witch's brew of all of the needs of the civil rights community. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, to get one of those uh, rare jobs uh, doing uh, something that was such righteous work. What was your initial reaction to the reality of uh, modern slavery, human trafficking, it has many names. Were, were you surprised that this had never gone away and in fact was enjoying an incredible resurgence that continues to this day in many regards? I have to say that personally I wasn't surprised. I think that people in the Latino community and African American and other immigrant communities um, aren't necessarily surprised when they see these things happen, disappointed, um, certainly. Um, but I think a lot of people are surprised to find out uh, because it's not something you get taught in, in high school. It's not something that, that people really uh, factor in as far as what are the pressing issues of today. Um, what I have been pleasantly surprised in is that the, there's nowhere I've gone in the United States or even other countries where people who learn about this don't then want to try to help out. Do they have a realistic sense of what they might do or are they just trying to help in any way possible? Well, I think that there's reality and then there's things that contain kernels of reality. 
uh, a lot of people are drawn to this uh, through something that almost might be reduced to, you know, kind of the fantasy of human trafficking that's, for instance, in the movie Taken or, or things like that, where um, there's good and there's evil and there and it's often children trapped in uh, sexual, commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and then they go to volunteer on human trafficking and they may end up meeting a, a man in his 60s who was held in a landscaping uh, business through threats of force. Or they might end up meeting a woman who claims that she's a voluntary participant in prostitution and doesn't know why people keep wanting to get her out. Um, that tests people's initial assumption. Um, but all of it comes back to the idea that people are suffering and if we want to do something about it, there are so many things that any person in the United States can do. You don't have to have a job that specializes in human trafficking to be able to help, help survivors. I definitely have some questions along those lines, but uh, um, just to follow up on the question of, of Hollywood and how it works with this issue helps to explain it, et cetera, et cetera. Regardless of how they approach the subject, is there still some utility to having people watch something dramatic that, that touches on this issue, just for informing them generally? Very much so. I can't overstate how important the Lifetime uh, television movie back in, I want to say 2004, 2005, was on this issue it's called Human Trafficking, starred Mira Sorvino, who then went on to uh, be an expert in her own right uh, as the United Nations Goodwill Ambassador against Human Trafficking. Uh, that ended up having an effect, uh, for instance, Senator Rubio and his wife um, have talked about how it was seeing that movie uh, that really stirred him to want to do something when he was in the Florida legislature uh, to confront human trafficking. Um, so too, if you look at, you know, movies that don't appear to be a, about human trafficking at first blush. Uh, 12 Years a Slave, one of the best movies made about slavery. Uh, the director, upon winning his Academy Award, uh, was able to tell people about the state of human trafficking and at that point the 20 plus million people who remain in modern slavery because he's active with a group called Anti-Slavery International in the United Kingdom. The writer of that show then went on uh, to do a miniseries the next year on American TV um, that was based in the fields with uh, people now in agricultural slavery as well as in sex slavery. Um, and so that idea of Hollywood being able to tell us these stories, these universal stories that cut across time, place, um, through American slavery and into the modern slave trade um, has been critical and we very much appreciate when people want to take it seriously and deal with it in, in a non-exploitative way. You've dealt with this issue in, in a global context. You mentioned the number regarding the population of people in forced servitude today. I've seen lower numbers, I've seen much higher numbers, up to 50 million, sometimes larger. How do we arrive at those figures? Are they best estimates? Are we being too liberal, too conservative with those numbers? Well, there's a lot of numbers, as you said. Um, the numbers that I tend to be very conservative and, and go with kind of a lower number, um, you've heard uh, 27 million is something that people have talked about a lot. Uh, new recent numbers uh, going up as high as 46 to 47 million. That is informed by uh, kind of taking estimates from other human rights issues, such as genocide, for instance. So taking some of the, the statistical um, uh, techniques that they use in estimations of, of those other crimes. And so it ended up with a higher number. It also includes forced marriage and some of those other social ills. Um, that's the newest number, circa late 2017. For me, though, um, the bigger number is if you look at the number of prosecutions, only about 9,000 a year, and that's a dramatic increase from in the past. If you look at the number of victims identified in the world last year, which is only around 50,000 people, um, victim identifications, when you divide them into, and I, I was not a math major, but when you divide that into 27 million people or 49 million people, and we've only been able to help 50,000 a year, regardless of whether it's the one bad fraction or the other bad fraction, it's something we should be ashamed of. Uh, countries around the world should be uh, lighting their hair on fire and going out and looking for trafficking victims. 
How do we, again, we're estimating, but it seems like the mix has changed. At one point, most of the people in forced servitude in the United States, for example, were brought in from uh, from other countries. And then we started to see this phenomenon developing of American citizens being trafficked within U.S. borders, which for some reason seems more horrifying to people than uh, people being trafficked from elsewhere. To me, it's all part of the same mm -hmm. you know, disgusting problem. But uh, how did we get to the point where it became convenient, lucrative, et cetera, to traffic U.S. citizens within U.S. borders? And is, is that something that we can hope to control any more than we're controlling the issue of, of people being brought in from other countries? Well, I think that some of it ends up being a semantic and a, and a definitional issue. Um, so it's a little unclear whether or not it's that U.S. citizen trafficking has risen um, or whether or not what we would have in the past called something else is now being fully recognized as being human trafficking. Let me explain that a little bit more. In 1910, the year after Congress had passed legislation to make it so that you didn't have to have a different slavery statute for each race. Before that, you had a st slavery statute for Hispanics, a st slavery statute for the Chinese workers who were being brought in, a slavery statute for the European workers being brought in through the what was called the padrone system, a slavery statute for the previously enslaved African American communities. In 1908, 1909, Congress does away with that. So technically, then, the protection of the 13th Amendment would have been available to everyone. The year after that, Congress pivots and enacts the Mann Act, which was supposed to be a sex trafficking solution. And what it did is it made it illegal to move uh, women and girls in prostitution across state lines. It didn't require that you show that they be held through force or coercion. What it very quickly did, and unfortunately lasted until we passed the new law in 2000, is that it segregated women and girls in sex trafficking into this other crime, this, the Mann Act in the United States parlance. By doing that, it basically removed them from the, from the slavery protections, the thing that says you should be free from being abused and kept in service through force and threats. The law in 2000 brings those concepts back together. And really what it was doing is it was saying, it doesn't matter if you're a domestic servant, it doesn't matter if you're in prostitution, you know, whether you're in a brothel or a farm, the US Constitution, the 13th Amendment, protects you from being enslaved. And with that protection then should come restoration. With that protection should come rehabilitation and counseling and job training, all of those things. And so in some ways, what you're recognizing in the uptick in cases involving US citizens is actually that we were able to bring that class of folks into the protections of the 13th Amendment once and for all. I think that the risk then becomes that for policymakers and for people in local communities, now it becomes almost dominant. People talk more about the child sex trafficking victim, especially the U.S. citizen child sex trafficking victim, and we need to make sure that we have things in place for the needs of their foreign cousins. How do we reach an ever larger percentage of the population? Because it seems that most people know something about it, and a few know, know more, but, but everyone should understand that this is a major global crime and it affects every community nobody escapes how, how do we how do we address that problem well i think part of it is we're addressing it just by you and i talking about it um, that's something that i'd love to see taken out into the into journalism as a whole um, i think that it, there are so many people who want to report on this issue there's so many people who do such good reporting and maybe we'll end up doing if they're lucky a two or three part series, whether in their local paper um, or are able to circle back to it on broadcast uh, journalism. Um, but it takes those multi-part um, explorations. It takes a sustained thing like we saw, frankly, with CNN's Freedom Project around the world. CNN came to us at the State Department and said, we'd like to work with you uh, for the next year. We've got a commitment from 
uh, corporate that we could do a series of reports on human trafficking. They weren't able to get it for CNN America, but to put it on CNN International. CNN America thought that it wasn't a story or it was too controversial or it was something that happened over there. Well, that was in year one. And this was supposed to, this was a breakthrough because they were going to have an entire year's worth of reporting. Six years has gone by and CNN Freedom Project is still one of the most popular segments on CNN International and it's being broadcast now as part of the interstitial programming on CNN in the U.S. Um, and I talked to one of the CNN uh, business side folks and I said, this is wonderful, but weren't you going to cancel this after the first year? It was just supposed to be a thing. He said that they had had so much feedback from people around the world on how important it was that CNN was telling those stories that they've extended it pretty much indefinitely. Well, what that does is it creates an entire generation of reporters for whom doing these stories is just one of the things they do. It's not considered outrageous or outlandish or that you're a troublemaker if you want to go and report on these stories or that you have a, a bee in your bonnet or something at CNN and therefore for an entire generation of broadcast journalists you've got folks who know how to investigate these cases so that to me is really one of the answers is you know I know that the media landscape has changed uh, and a lot of stuff is uh, person to person, whether it's social media or otherwise. But a large part of this to me is getting it so that the editors and the business side folks will let reporters go out and tell these stories. And, you know, once you have a free press that tells stories about vulnerable people, it strikes people's heartstrings. Uh, and you start to have consumers asking, you know, where did the cotton come from for my shirt? Where the the shrimp uh, in my dinner last night, you know, was that harvested in a sustainable and, and fair manner. That only happens because journalists are out there doing their jobs. Well, let's focus uh, more, more narrowly on the people who are victimized by this. We talk about victims, we talk about survivors, and I know many of the people who are victimized don't survive, but this is an ever-growing group of people, no matter how long it takes to fix this, is going to be victims and or survivors uh, along the way. How do we address their needs, especially the ones who have come out of this terrible experience and are trying to make their way back into the mainstream. Is, is that possible in every case? And what are we not doing that we should be doing? Well, there's a lot in that question. Yeah. <laughs> so the, you know, the number one thing to remember is that this is not just, you know, unlike anti-corruption or smuggling in wildlife parts or something like this. This is not simply a crime against the sovereignty of a, a country. This is a crime against that human right that that person had to be free from slavery, to be free from involuntary servitude. And once you see it as a violation of their human right, with the state being the guarantor of that human right, the response necessarily that the state has to take on ends up being very different. It becomes as much about prevention and protection as it does about prosecution of the trafficker themselves. What that means is a very different relationship between the state and that victim, hopefully getting them to the point where they are a survivor who's recovered from what they've done, maybe even a survivor who can then turn around and grab an oar and, and contribute to the fight. One of the most heartening things that we've seen over the last few years was the creation of the President's Advisory Council, um, which brought in survivors to be able to tell the Obama White House and now the Trump White House what it is that they themselves needed based on what they've gone through. And what's been fascinating is that there are people who would pull parts of the trafficking community into its component parts, people who only want to work on cases involving U.S. citizen child prostitution cases, or people who only want to work on, say, for instance, farm worker or domestic servant cases. The Survivor Advisory Council themselves, made up of people who've all gone through these things, their reaction to each other and their seeing the commonalities in their suffering, whether they were a 14-year-old white American or a 45-year-old um, 
you know, man from Africa who's been enslaved. These people, as soon as they find out what happened to each other, they see the commonality in what they live through. And by listening to them and incorporating that into policy making, incorporating that into uh, what we actually do as far as enforcement, we're better as a country by having survivors' voices inform us. So that's something that the United States is taking out around the world, the Trump administration, as seriously as, as the Obama administration, to try to push this idea of hearing survivors' voices as part of the response. But as to the other part of your question, there are some survivors who will end up needing lifetime care. And so it's incumbent on us to make sure that the local service providers, whether uh, in a mid-sized city, whether nationally at the Department of Health and Human Services, that 20 years from now, 40 years from now, those services will be there for those people whose lives were shattered because there are some of them who may never recover. And, and even the people who are doing a good job need to be able to touch base, to come back, to circle back. Uh, those long-term relationships are now happening uh, in a very positive way. But it all comes back to them. And if we're not doing this for them, then we probably shouldn't be doing it at all. When you were invited to serve in an ambassadorial position with combating human trafficking worldwide as your portfolio, did you feel more powerful, more challenged, or both in terms of trying to resolve the problem? Well, a lot of what I did as ambassador was a continuation of what I'd been able to do during both the Clinton and Bush administrations uh, from the Justice Department as the lead prosecutor. I was. Uh, what was called the Involuntary Servitude and Slavery Coordinator uh, in the Clinton um, administration um, that then got relabeled as trafficking uh, once the international term came in after our law in 2000. Um, but my day-to-day -day job hadn't really changed much. Um, moving over to the State Department gave me that much more broad of a playing field. I had a lot of contacts in other countries from investigating cases, uh, with through the UN as far as coming up with training uh, modules for police and prosecutors, etc. But once I acted um, as an ambassador, speaking directly for the president, um, you know, at the assistant secretary level with the secretary of state, um, the throw weight of being able to speak directly uh, for the U.S. government, I think, made that much more effective. It's why this ambassadorship is so important. Um, it's something that as of uh, our conversation today, uh, a year's gone by and the Trump administration has yet to announce who the new ambassador will be. Um, but we're certainly hoping that it'll be somebody who, like we had during the Bush and Obama administrations, will be able to speak directly for the president. When you look at this problem long term, um, are, are we in a place where we can realistically embrace a future, as, as, as Kevin Bales has outlined in one of his books, that would actually end slavery? Or is that just pie in the sky, something that will, mm -hmm. will take so long it's not realistic within our lifetimes? Well, Kevin, um, as you know, Kevin and I are, are friends and colleagues for, for many years now. And uh, Kevin uh, is a sociologist uh, by training. Um, you know, I am a prosecutor by training. And I cut my teeth on prosecuting domestic violence, sexual violence cases. Um, after I was ambassador, I ran the office of the State Department that deals with sex offenders. Um, and so was very involved in campus sexual assault responses, as well as really delving in as to what makes these predators tick. Um, and unfortunately, what I've come to the conclusion with is that just w as with rape, murder, domestic violence, that the prospect of a world without slavery is something that we have to fight for and something that we have to um, work towards. Um, but we also have to understand that the day after we say that we've achieved that goal, we may wake up the next morning and someone will have enslaved someone. And so it's incumbent on us, I think, to focus our uh, efforts on ending slavery but at the same time focus our efforts on having sustainable, effective, and victim-centered approaches to help put people's lives together if and when that continues. We're coming toward the end of our program, but I'm curious. Uh, you, you don't sound like many politicians. You sound like someone who wants to fix problems. And at the same time, a politician needs that in his or her portfolio of 
capabilities, uh, you know, solving problems. But um, if if you had to pick a political office that you you think would be ideal, uh, what, what would it be? <laughs> well, I'm asking if you're running for office, but it's just just in the abstract. You know, I've been lucky uh, in my public um, career to be able to put bad guys in jail and to help. Uh, victims get back on uh, with their lives, and so in some ways, you know, the the best job I think would be the the district attorney in a in a place where um, you do interesting cases and and really make a difference. Having said that, when you look at at uh, the work just of uh, Senator Corker and, and Senator Cardin uh, on human trafficking and other human rights issues uh, in the Senate, um, they've made a, a big difference. And frankly, having been at the point of the spear. Uh, knowing that they and others uh, had a, had my back uh, was something that I could really bank on. Um, having said that, um, I doubt that you'll see me uh, uh, reporting for duty in, in that circumstance. Well, great. We thank you so much for joining us today, Ambassador Sedebak. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>